Hi, this is Devjani Aish from Moose Laboris, India. And this is Rajesh Srinivasan from Moose Laboris, Singapore. And we're at a coffee breakout where we've had a fantastic conversation about AI and what's happening here. And I had a bunch of questions I want to ask Rajesh. Sure. Okay. Anyway. AI, chat GPT, clients and legal service. Where are we at right now? Yeah, okay. Well, there's a lot of um, interest yeah. in chat GPT. People have been asking me questions such as, for example, uh, clients, can I now start doing this on my own? Do I actually need to use a lawyer anymore? So I would always add an air of caution when it comes to GPT, chat GPT in particular, because it's generative AI. And what that means is it learns to be able to answer questions in a semantically correct manner, but not in a factually accurate manner. And that's a huge difference because when it comes to practices like law, you need factual accuracy and semantic accuracy. So what happened in for real life examples that we share with our clients is where we've done ask uh, ChatGPT specific questions, and what it does is it creates cases that do not exist. Okay. They literally don't exist, but it is presented in a perfectly formed manner. So when you ask ChatGPT, can you give me the citation for these cases? It will say, you know, Singapore High Court District page two six five etc. Just as if you would be able to find it in the actual citation, but when you actually open the book. It's not there. So always remember, GPT is a fantastic tool for conversations, for marketing material, for summarizing text, etc., but not for hardcore legal research. It just can't do it. So as long as clients are aware of that, then I think it will lead to a much more harmonious relationship between lawyers and clients because they will still see the need to rely on the lawyers to do the heavy lifting when it comes to some of the legal research but augmented by ChatGPT. So ChatGPT becomes a very important tool in the arsenal of tools that lawyers have today to be able to become more efficient, to be you know, able to, to do things at a much quicker pace, but not necessarily at a cheaper cost because the lawyers still need to intervene to make sure that, just like I mentioned before, facts are facts. So the actual cases are presented. ChatGPT will help in all of the other places in terms of summarizing, in terms of drafting the first cut of documents, etc. But you still need to make sure that it's done with the lawyer's uh, oversight. So that's an interesting point because they're talking about, look, ground reality is cost efficiency in a post-pandemic world, yeah. even otherwise is, is reality. Mm -hmm. When we have a tool that could potentially reduce costs yeah. at the cost of wrong citations, which is very alarming. Absolutely. What does the client look at? What are we looking at from a perspective of how we can harmonize this for for clients? Mm -hmm. I think um, we will still see potential cost savings for clients. That's the good news. Yeah. Uh, it's just that clients need to be managed in terms of their expectations, in terms of where the cost savings are going to happen. So an example where cost savings can occur would be in areas like due diligence, um, areas such as uh, where there's a lot of e-discovery work that needs to be done. There are tools in the market like Relativity, there are tools like Kira, etc., that allow you to go through tons of documents at a much faster pace. And so the number of uh, lawyers' hours required for those heavy lifting, that will go down. So I think that's where clients can expect some degree of cost savings. Moving a little bit away from that, say going into issues like potential bias, yes. discrimination, balance, things like yeah. that. Absolutely. Where do we see ourselves there? Well, AI systems are inherently unable to reason the, right. the large language models that we're using But today. they speak beautifully. They speak beautifully. They, speak beautifully. they, they will speak in a very convincing tone right. as well. Yeah. And it's prone to this concept of hallucination, which means it creates a certain rea rea reality in its own uh, analysis, and it will fight to the end to show that that is true. And that's not a good thing either. And that means that when it comes to things like bias, mm. it can, such biases can get ingrained into the systems based on the text on which the systems are trained. So if you feed biased information into the system, it will inherently become biased. Uh, and these are some of the weaknesses that the systems have. The key message for us to remember is that these are artificial intelligence systems. They are unable to emote they are unable to, in a sense, discriminate on their own. But if we feed it with discriminatory parameters, right. 
it will then act in a very discriminatory manner as Which well. is a massive concern yes. in an environment where we're looking at inclusion and diversity Absolutely. if we don't have the right yep. data going in. Yes, sorry. Flowing yes. from that, confidentiality, what are we looking at about that? Now, we have a tool that's available where clients may want to use it um, in a good way. Sure. Without understanding the pitfalls of maybe feeding in data, uh, can you talk a little? Now, I'm curious about. I'm very curious about that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very good question you raised. That uh, the AI systems that we use today, things like ChatGPT, for example, they make it very clear that they do not retain the data, and that is true to an extent. Okay. So it will not cut and paste and keep a copy of the data in its own systems. But what it does in the process of analyzing the data to give you an output is that it learns the language models of those sentences. Ah, okay. So if you were to feed it an legal opinion, for example, it will learn the structure of the legal opinion. It will learn what are the types of facts that were shared without actually taking in the words, but understanding the context, the syntax, and all the rest of it without, as I say again, storing the actual words. The, okay, the that's point, interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And that, okay. That's a concern because it means that if you are feeding it a precedent, right. um, even a memorandum of understanding, yeah. which sets out the commercial terms of a deal, it will learn the structure uh -huh. of the deal and it will okay. then be able to recreate that same structure for someone else who asks for a structured deal along those bases. And sometimes, as you know, in many of these deals, the structure is the key. Yes. And you do not want things like that. It's just one example of how you can inadvertently leak client information through ChatGPT. That's something interesting again. I really didn't think about how it actually is because you've been hearing the dialogue around it. Yeah. But these real life examples are super interesting. Um, what, else, what else are we looking at just from an employer and employee perspective? Sure. I think the big concern there, of course, these days is with AI coming in, what's it going to lead to in terms of the workforce expectations? I think the biggest expectation that employers will have is for employees to know how to use these systems and tools. Mm. So I would look at it from an opportunistic perspective and say that you know anyone out there in any line, whether you're in analytics or you're in the frontline administration work, it behooves all of us to spend time to understand how ChatGPT works, right? And to see how it can help us in our daily work as well. And if we always look at ChatGPT as a tool, that augments rather than replaces us, that would be the right mentality. But I think we also need to be realistic because yeah. with uh, the efficiency gains that GPT have demonstrated, there will be significant amounts of white collar work that will become redundant very rapidly. And it's therefore necessary for employers, responsible employers, to start the process of thinking about restructuring and re-engineering these individuals, retraining them in new skill sets that are required in the AI world. So for example, one, just, just share one example with you, uh, this area called prompt engineering. Yes. The ability to ask AI systems the right question is not an easy thing to do. It requires a fair bit of training. We don't know how to ask the right questions. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. If you don't ask the right question, it will give you very inaccurate, long, elaborate, yeah. and you know, ultimately unusable questions. Yeah. So if we spend time training our employees right. to become good prompt engineers, they will be the frontline people running these tools mm. to get the right responses from the AI system. So I think there's still a lot of scope for retraining of our people. That will be the key focus coming up. Okay, thank you. No Thanks a lot. <laughs>